Hi everyone, uh, Dave here. Thanks for coming along to another episode of Legends of the Spire. I'm here in my garden on my old Saltergate seat um, to introduce another episode of the podcast. And this week it's with Dave Caldwell. Uh, now the Scottish striker had two spells with Chesterfield, in, one in the 1980s, one in the 1990s. Um, so it was really good to speak to him uh, about those two periods of the club and what it was like joining from a rival uh, as he came to us from Mansfield Town. He then had some really interesting spells in Belgium and South Africa, uh, so we had a good chat about his career as a whole, um, and then also about his move into business uh, as well, and the similarities between being a footballer and being a businessman, uh, which I hope you all find interesting. Uh, one thing I must learn from this podcast is to stop asking players about their nicknames, as with both um, Lee Rogers and his knobby nickname, and Dave Caldwell and his shaggy nickname, uh, both came up with answers that are not broadcastable. <laughs> um, so I suppose that's just a uh, life of a footballer. Um, as always, we are at Spire Legends on Twitter and Legends of the Spire on Facebook. So do get in touch. Also, Legends of the Spire Outlook.com if you do want to send an email. Uh, but for now, here we are with the latest episode of Legends of the Spire with the pacey, goal scoring, hot headed hero, Dave Caldwell. Interesting, actually, because I've, I've interviewed um, a couple of uh, Scottish players that have played for Chesterfield. I've had uh, Jamie Winter, who was um, uh, born Dundee, and I've had Mark Innes, who's more Glasgow, but you're uh, Aberdeen, is that right? Originally, but live in Glasgow now. So, Originally from Aberdeen, um, I, I moved to Glasgow, been married for about 17 years. I moved to Glasgow about 18, 19 years ago. So I've um, been here probably the longest I've ever been anywhere um because mostly i moved around quite a lot because the thing is you can't hit a moving target as they say so um, <laughs> just just through work through football and then through work mm. moved around yeah so what was it so what was it like growing up were you a, were you an aberdeen fan or were you supporting someone else no i was a rangers fan um my, my dad actually played for um, Aberdeen, so the reason I was born in Aberdeen was my dad met my mum. My dad was originally from Clyde Bank, just outside Glasgow, and um, he played for Aberdeen 54, won the league um, at that time, runners up in the Scottish Cup, I think league championship medal at the time. So um, I was early, I was brought up, I was only three year old when we moved to Canada because he actually played in Canada with um, Stanley Matthews and people that he played against. Wow. Push Pano, um, in a charity match and I think it was. So my dad in his, his own right was a, a very, very good player. So um, I was brought up as a range supporter in Aberdeen, but um, it wasn't as bad as it is now because being a Rangers fan in Aberdeen now is not good. <laughs> What, I what, thought it was a lot better. <laughs> what what position was he playing in? You know, my dad was a fullback. My dad, my dad actually played left. Back. He was right footed. So um, he was, um, and it, it's interesting because I've got his Scottish Cup medal. I've got his Scottish Cup runners up medal and his league championship medal and things like that. Mm. And I was always, I was always brought up as my dad has the same name, Dave Caldwell. So I was always so you Dave Caldwell's son. Um, so. It was in, it was interesting. Um, he never because he did his own team, so basically he used to run a junior team. Mm. So he hardly ever seen the play. So and he did a couple of times say, "Oh, you should go maybe go play for this team, slightly better organised." But really never got involved in my career at all in the early stages. It just kind of evolved, and I, and I played just through my own kind of um, practicing all the time, just played it all. Mm. Did it feel quite, did your route and passion into football then feel a little bit separate to your dad's or, or were you into yeah. it because he was into it? Yeah, my dad, um, my dad was never an encourager. My dad was always, um, you could do this better, you could do that better, etc. Um, so he was more critical, but not in a bad kind of way. Hmm. But I played football from, I mean, I played football from a very young age and I used to play from, I used to leave school play from four o'clock to half past nine every night <laughs> during the week under the street lights in the park. And that's that's how you that's how you learn how to play football. And the other thing that probably helped me a lot to make it was that 
played against the older guys all the time. So I was I was fourteen year old playing against thirty year olds. I kicked lumps at me. So I I kind of got used to um, that type of kind of physicality at an early age. Yeah, because because a lot of youngsters, I suppose, when they go through that route into football and then get thrown into men's football or first team football, can get beaten up a bit, can't they? <laughs> yeah, no, I think a lot of them get shocked. But I, I played Highland League for a sign for Mansfield, and the Highland League was it was a really tough league. So, um, and I think that was, and we'll probably lead into playing for Mansfield in a bit, but. The Highland League was a very, I mean, I went from 16-year-old playing under 16 to one game in kind of senior football, what you call the junior kind of leagues. Yeah. Um, and then I signed for Inverness Cali um, after one game. And I only played 13 games for Inverness Cali and scored 13 goals. I think I scored four goals in my last game. And um, I had a cue, one of the, the players that played with him, who was a well-known player, played for Rangers, Andy Penman, who was kind of like 36, 37 at the time, said, you see all the, the scouts in the stand, so it was nice meeting you. You won't be here next season. And I kind of laughed and walked off the pitch, but he was absolutely right. <laughs> so, was, there, was there interest from a few different clubs then? Yeah, I'd read, I'd Chelsea, Reading, Leicester, um, Mansfield, all showed an interest. Mansfield, jumped on kind of it more quickly than everybody else. I was offered trial to other ones, but basically Mansfield invited me down, uh, which was quite entertaining because it was the day, I travelled down the day of the Scotland-England match. Well, I travelled down the Friday on the train down to um, what was Chesterfield. I went down to, obviously, because and it was absolutely mobbed of Scottish fans drinking. I just I stunk of alcohol by the time I got to the station, but I was picked up in Jerry Clark and met Jock Basford and then Billy Bingham. Um, and they, they give it, they, they give it, and they were, they were kind of, I think, third division at the time. And I got a good feeling about them. I went back home, came back down, and, my, and I actually played a trial match. And you never believe, I mean, it's like, you couldn't write the, for physicality purposes, I played against Norman Hunter, Barnsley. <laughs> Norman Hunter was a manager, and Mick McCarthy was the other centre half. Crikey. <laughs> so I wasn't the physicality didn't bother me because it was very physical and the and I was just very fast. I mean, my early days, my my, my game changed as I got older. Um, when I was at Mansfield, I was running the hundred meters in eleven seconds. I was still I was still running hundred meters in eleven seconds with Chesterfield because um, I John Tivy um, was a kind of I think my wealth coach did the preseason training and he says you're faster than some of my Commonwealth guys and I did actually go down one Sunday and train with them so that was my biggest asset was very fast so they couldn't catch me to kick me so it was great in the younger days It was quite a hefty fee wasn't it to Mansfield it was like 25,000 or something Yeah well I mean in those days it was actually a very I mean Ian Wilson and Kevin McDonald because I played with Kevin McDonald that went to Liverpool Hmm. so Kevin was in the same team at Inverness so the year later Kevin went to Liverpool and I'm not sure what he went for but Ian Wilson went to Leicester 25 grand as well from um, Elgin I think it was and um, somebody said it was equivalent to 300,000 now uh, in today's kind of money so if you look at that I was 17 year old just turning 18 so yeah. it was a lot of money to be fair I was worth it at the time <laughs> Is, um, when looking, I mean I had a lot of potential I was very, very fast. I mean, and, and I think that's what excited a lot of the fans. Fans love pace. They see you getting the ball and just running past players. Um, that was the kind of probably underachieved um, over my career, I would probably say, looking back. So so how, how quickly did you kind of hit the ground running and find your feet at Mansfield? Did it take a while or was it just pretty instant? No, I think, I think within... I think, I mean, I actually had my debut, well, I had my come on as a sub against Reading. Um, and then the season late, that was the end of the season, which whatever it was, that was about 88, I think it was. I think 89, I made my debut. Um, and then I was a regular from from being really 18, 18, just 
mid eighteens to nineteens. I was I was I was actually it was interesting because I was actually playing in front of players that cost a lot of money, a hundred thousand. Kerry Austin, um, Steve Taylor, players like that. I was playing on them, but I was I was also scoring a lot of goals, which helps. So I think yeah. if you score goals, nobody's going to drop you. Absolutely, yeah. So so I'm guessing you'll have had to have moved down and and, and moved to moved to Mansfield. Then were you in Diggs or were you? Yeah, first of all in Biggs and then a flat with a couple of other Scottish guys, guys like Les McJanet and Ian Ian Jimison. Um but it it was um it was interesting because Kevin Bird, so um Kevin kinda took me under his wing. So my first training session um for the club was on a Monday and Kevin says, Right, we're going for lunch. We went to the Portland Arms for lunch. And I didn't know that was you kind know, of what we did every day, apart from a Thursday and a Friday. So we we never went out on a Thursday and a Friday for purposes. Some players obviously did, but to be fair, over my career, very rarely, and it was down to more mistakes where I was probably injured. Um, I'll tell you a good story later on about that at Chesterfield. But um, no, I, and it was a regular thing in the eighties. Just it was the basically to do with the team spirit, which was vodka. <laughs> you know <what> I mean, <laughs> and um, we all went to the pub. Um, so I was an alcoholic by 19. No, I wasn't that statue. <laughs> I suppose. I suppose when you're still quite young, I mean, it's, it's. I mean, it's a. It's kind of a dream life, isn't it? When you when you're young, you get to move somewhere, be a footballer, kind of house with a few mates, and yeah, stuff, and it's great. Isn't it? look, look, looking back, I mean, I still get asked to be, and, and I help a lot. Of, I've kind of been in and out of football for the last. I'm, I'm actually on the board of the Clyde FC Foundation now. Hmm. Um, which is just recent, but I've been in and out of football um, over all, all the years, and I've also helped a lot of kids into games and trials and things like that, giving them advice. And, lo- and looking back, I wasn't prepared for football, and I was actually, I mean, people that probably will watch this will find this amazing, but I was actually quite shy when I was 17. Um, it was actually football that gave me my confidence. Hmm. Um, so when I came down from Ab- Aberdeen, I wasn't really, I wasn't that kind of probably Jack the lad I ended up. <laughs> I mean, so um, I was I was quite shy, but but I just realised what football could get because it was also on a quite a lot of money. I mean, I know I got, I got signed, but I, I was getting £500 a month when I was 17 in mm. 80, 87, 88, which was a lot of money. I mean, and some, some months, the next season, I got a wage increase. We're obviously getting our penis money and win bonuses by that point. So I, I was close to getting £800 a month away back then, which, however that is now, it's still a quite a lot of money. So, yeah. And and I suppose it's funny you talk about like being being shy and confidence and, and stuff like that. Was it always the case that when you crossed the white line onto a football pitch, you kind of clicked into? you know, clicked into kind of being confident and especially with being a goal scorer as well. Yeah, de- definitely a different. I mean, it's interesting. A lot of people ask me that question on you know, crossing that white line. I was definitely a different person crossing that white line. Um, and l- latterly as well, I become, I mean, even in my early days, I was, I was very hot-headed and aggressive on the pitch, but not typically off the pitch. Hmm. I mean, so off the pitch, I wouldn't be fighting in nightclubs or fighting in the streets or anything like that. But on the pitch, I was just fiercely competitive. I hate I hated getting beat, and I, and I basically took it as a personal challenge. So I seen it as a gladiator thing when we played against centre halves. I went on that pitch and basically the muscles were sticking. I even though I wasn't that big in the early days, do you know what I mean? I went on that pitch and it was basically I'm I'm going to win uh, all costs. And sometimes I across that line, obviously, on a lot of occasions where the physicality got me into trouble. It's interesting you say that, actually, because I read, I was reading an article about your, uh, I think your years at, at Mansfield, and it was saying that one game, I think you got sent off after 14 minutes against Reading, and then the, the did the manager put you on the transfer list after that game, but then you scored four goals in the next match or something? Yeah, four goals, and I think I scored three the match afterwards. <laughs> I don't think he was very happy. So, so you were. I mean, you played a lot of games for Mansfield, didn't you? And you were there. Um, you were there for, for quite a while. Played a lot of games. Scored a lot of goals. Six, six years. I think I'm still the 
ninth because I get reminded by so I'm I'm actually doing I've got to do something for the program and, and they've invited me down on the fourth for the Harrogate game and I haven't been I haven't been at Mansfield I've been back at Chesterfield more than I have at Mansfield um, not not actually sure why I played longer at Mansfield probably achieved more um, so I think I'm a ninth top goal scorer in history still um, I think I'm I'm the fastest goal scorer in history for Mansfield so I think I scored 11 seconds nice so there's a lot of things that I've even to this day, which are many years ago, mm-hmm. um, I, I, I did very well at Mansfield. You know, when, um, I didn't go pear shaped after leaving Mansfield. It was uh, probably moving to Chesterfield, which we'll take about in a bit, was obviously a, it was a, a, the right move at the right time. But I think the period in between where I went to Carlisle on loan and Swindon, I probably missed an opportunity there to play at a really high level. Because mm. I went, I went to Carlisle with Bob Stoko when it was um, they were second division, and I was, I was basically with Ian Bishop and people like that. They obviously ended up playing for England and West Ham and Man City. So I had a Malcolm Poskett, Alan Shoulder. So I had a really good opportunity there to probably make it, and probably my lifestyle was the thing that killed me. Is that something you you look back on now and kind of kick yourself about sometimes? Yeah, I do, and I don't. I get asked that a lot as well. I do and I don't. To be fair, the eight, the eighties when I played seventies, eighties, and nineties, well, obviously late seventies through the eighties and and ninety four. So I've, I've seen all the, those generations and all that, and I played a long time. But the eighties was an unbelievable thing to play football. There was no Facebook. There was no. I mean, there was no mobile phones. Yeah. Um, the lifestyle was. Was like a rock star. I mean, you were going out. You were, you didn't have to queue for nightclubs. You, do you know what I mean? And it was very enjoyable. Football now, I, w- I would say they make a lot of money. Are they having a great time? It's a real dedicated lifestyle now. Yeah. yeah. Um, to do with diet and things like that. The the life that we had was totally different, and it was more enjoyable from that aspect of being a kind of football player. Do you know what I mean? So yeah, I don't re- I don't regret. I regret not playing at a higher level, but in terms, I had a good, I had a good, fantastic life for many years. You know what I mean? Mm, yeah, absolutely. It was John Duncan that signed you, wasn't it? Dunks, yeah, brilliant, loved them. Dunks, the only only manager I ever met, like that used to say, like, so if we get in front, obviously we just sit and defend. So we would score after five minutes, and then we'd be wasting time for the for the next eighty five minutes. Do you know what I mean? Was it as bad as that? <laughs> Bob, Bob Newton tells that joke as well, but because Kevin Randall was there as well, and um, sadly passed away as well. But Dunks was Dunks was funny because it was me and Fergie, Brian Ferguson, we lived in kind of flat together, and with Brian Scrimmager, and we were in because he had the Black Swan, I think it was a Black Swan um, pub, and we used to be. Me and Fergie end up being disc jockeys in there <laughs> because it, the lifestyle was quite, was quite, quite mad at, at times. You know what I mean? Never out the Aquarius. Um, do you know what I mean? It was, the dunks used to, with a tongue in cheek, used to always say like, "Where are you guys?" I mean, we used to come in with hangovers all the time. Terrible. I mean, any kids watch this, they like, never do what we did in the eighties. <laughs> Whole different game. Dunks was really funny. I mean, some of the story. Actually, there was a Wolves game. There was a couple of people speak about the Wolves game for Roger. I think Roger Eli, the guy's name was. And um, Dunks at half time. So, what was happening? The ball was getting pinged through, and I was actually going 100 miles an hour through the goalkeeper. He was picking it out, throwing it out to the fullback, Roger Eli, and he was taking off. And Dunks is shouting, chase him, chase him. And he was causing all sorts of problems. And Dunks says at half time, look, take care of him. If you don't see if you don't take care of him, you're coming off. So the next high ball in the air, I've just thrown an elbow at him <laughs> and spark out. Didn't realise, I mean, spark out off to hospital. Do you know what I mean? And um, and after the game, the police interviewed me and said uh, somebody had complained about it. And to be fair, I mean, it wasn't a, it was a, I did catch him. Um, 
wasn't even premeditated. It was just, I mean, it was just, and Dunk said after the game, he said, look, I says take care of him. I'm, I meant it was during the game, not for good. I said, I think you've killed him. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> so Dunk's sense of humour was really, really funny. Like, um, but, um, no, I really enjoyed my time there. Great, great time at Chesterfield. It's, it's funny as well, I was talking to, I can't remember which player I was talking to about it, but they were talking about how Kevin Davis, when he was at Chesterfield and they were kind of practising corners, it would be Kevin Davis's job from a, an attacking corner to run back to the halfway line as soon as the ball came into the box. Is there anything like that for you as well? Yeah, Dunk to his side, used to drive me mad because of the, obviously I was a striker. Do you know what I mean? And all I could hear is, go down, go down. That's all I would hear from the sideline, screaming and all that. But, um, no, I, do you know, it's, it's quite funny actually because I've been a manager myself. <laughs> Um, not at that level obviously but I, I got him just before I, I ended up going to work for a living um, I was a manager up at the Highland League the, um, manager a lot of mouth and we actually played six at the back predominantly because we had too many defenders and we were losing a lot of goals even with those but I played a system that we played in Belgium when I was in Belgium and um, we used to do the same so we used to score and just sit in and defend I used, to, I used to always think, I kind of believe I'm like Dunk now. What a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> Turned into him. And, um, and yeah, that first season, how quickly did you kind of find your feet at Chesterfield? I was just looking at your, your stats yeah. the first season. No, I, straight in the team. And, and I, I'm, uh, mostly played every game apart from being injured. I mean, there were some, there were some games that were... I mean, I had to, it was interesting, Chesterfield, just before the, life, the lifestyle. It was, um, <clears throat> we were out enjoying ourselves all the time. I mean, it was, there was no doubt about it. Um, and we used to go to the Bradbury Hall um, for the snooker down there and play snooker in the afternoon, have a couple of beers and then go out at night and have more beers. Um, but we'd always get to training. There was never a case that we would be that bad, we wouldn't get to training. But um, there was one occasion, I'll be here, I'll tell you a story about we played Middlesbrough. Hmm. It was quite a interesting story. So I was I got injured on Thursday, a training session, and I kind of like just a, a half strain. So come Friday, I was in getting treatment. Didn't think it was going to be any good. It's still kind of stiff. So the physio, I can't even remember who the physio. I think it was a, was it Dave Rushbury? Was that the first time or second time? Because twice there, obviously. Try to think of the physio was no, it was sat. It was a physio. Anyway, physio said. In and we'll see how you are, etc. And then come in Saturday morning before the game because it's a game on a Tuesday. So I'd gone out on a Friday night till about four in the morning, came in straight to 10 o'clock in the morning for physio, straight for the nightclubs, more or less. Hadn't been home, same gear on, etc. <laughs> gone in, getting a bit of treatment, got some kit on, started walking around the pitch. And the physio was going like, you don't, how do you feel? And I said, that just feels all right. I said, I must have drank it off. I said, but if I find out, I'll be out, I'll get killed. <laughs> do you know what I mean? So, and he, so he said, well, go and see what it's like. So I ran about a little bit more, kicked the ball about. It was kind of fine. So he says, look, go home, have a shower, have a kip, come back at two o'clock. In the meantime, he'd always say to Dunks, he said, um, I think I think Cold was his fit. <laughs> and he's like, What do you mean fit? I said, well, he was in this morning, he seems fine. So the next minute I'm dragged into the office. Are you fit? And I was like, Ah, it seems to be all right, Gaffer. And he was like, You out last night? And I was like, Well, I didn't think I was playing, Gaffer. That's two weeks' wages. You're getting fine two weeks' wages. And he said, If you and he said, If you don't if you don't play well the day, I'm gonna play you. And and if you don't, you two weeks' wages, etc. And he was all he was actually hacked off from it, but playing me. Middlesbrough, Gally Pallister and Tony Mowbray, and I scored two goals in about 20 minutes. They were both actually cracking goals. <laughs> and um, I was like that. I ran past the dugout and I was like that. Dunks. It's just like, you've either got it or you haven't. <laughs> and he was raging with me for about two weeks. Out. He never find me except we won the game and it was a great result for him. So um, that, was, that was one of the funny stories at Chesterfield. Which is or Arthur will take? Harper with the kick. Clear there by uh, 
Phil Brown. And Dave Colwell breaking well for Chester really. Phil Colwell going all the way. Oh, and a very good effort there by Dave Colwell, bringing a good save out of Mike Salmon. But uh, question marks around the Bolton defence a little bit there. But nevertheless, good enterprise in play from Chesterfield number nine, Colwell. And we have Chesterfield on the surge forward again. And Dave Colwell intercepted nicely by Julian Darby to Lee Coombs. Lee Coombs floating one in for Dave Colwell. Dave Colwell, good goal. Very good goal. Yes, Colwell always been a thorn in Bolton's side tonight. And uh, very good goal. Very good goal. It's, it's funny as well because he signed some great strikers didn't he in his uh in his dunks. time at this field dunks he could play dunk dunks used to challenge us he used to get corners from either side 10 corners from either side good touch the goalkeeper in so with chris marples and goals and basically you only had two touches and you had to touch score and went to stay outside the so it was got um outside the box or just in the box you couldn't come into the box and dunks just first touch goal, first touch goal, first touch goal. Abs, I mean, he played for Spurs in Scotland. I mean, he had well, done you know, he was a he was a good player. Mm. So he always had an eye for a striker. That that would be the thing. He would see probably why he would see in a striker. Mm -hmm. I mean, so no, he, he did sign he did sign some good strikers. Yeah. And you played with some good strikers as well, didn't you? You kind of mentioned you mentioned Ernie Moss, but what's what's it like? Uh like? Ernie was um Ernie used to pick me up on the way home. <laughs> Ernie used to actually drive past me sometimes when I was coming home <laughs> the night before and all that and pick me up and take me. And Ernie was very obviously straight laced, like very professional. He used to say, I used to say I used to say, Ernie, I'm just gonna wander around you, you just go win the ball and I'll find it. Do you know what I mean? And that that's basically how so a lot of the game was into Ernie, not back into the hole, and I would go or basically I would be watching Ernie, not the ball. So the ball would be played forward, and I'd just be looking for Ernie touching it off, and then I'd be looking for the ball. So no, I, pl I played with Ernie. Ernie was, um, I mean, he he played for a long time, very well respected guy. Right? Um, and he was, I mean, and it was like we were at a his testimonial. He used to have his, um, it was quite interesting. He used to have his. Nights at the testimonial darts and dominoes and everything like that. Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> he just used to laugh, he just used to look at us and laugh. Do you know what I mean? We would just be, we'd be wild, you know what I mean? We'd be in like playing darts and dominoes, drinking, and away to the nightclub. He used to say another, another like testimonial night in the pub. The guys were like, Yes, Ernie, come on, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> nah, he was a good guy, Ernie. Sadly, missed. Yeah. Um, what, what was it like? I was, I was going to mention kind of what was it like moving from a rival? Um, it, it, it could have gone horribly wrong, but it didn't. Um, and I actually still lived in Mansfield when I moved to Chesterfield. And I actually went out in Mansfield quite a lot. Mm. Um, I never got... It, it was quite interesting because there was a lot of rivalry. And I, and I thought I would get some stick. It was more banter, but I, I never got any stick whatsoever from the Mansfield fans. Um, I actually get more stick now on Twitter because I'm I'm on Twitter and I kind of have little bursts on Twitter. And um, obviously I play for a lot of people, so I'm very neutral and I sit in the fence yeah. when it comes to games. Um, but I did have one Mansfield, what was it? I think it was one Mansfield or Chesterfield fan said, you obviously like them better than you like us. Because I'd said something, do you know what I mean? It was like, well, not really, just different teams. Experiences, um, do you know what I mean? So... So second season at Chesterfield was the season where you scored a lot of goals, really, wasn't it? It was like 14 goals that season, I think. It's like 86, 87 season. Yeah, yeah. I, I got, um, I'm not sure. I mean, I think, I think obviously just the transition. It's like, it's like anything. You've got to bed in and there's certain players. I, mean, I played with Dave Waller as well for a, for a bit, obviously. And um, I always scored goals. I mean, I think I scored one. It was one in three. I think it was about one in three my whole career. Um, I had a lot of problems with injuries. My hamstrings, because I was so fast, my hamstrings were the problem. So I, I did have a lot of injuries, which probably stopped me probably playing. As I think on hindsight, knowing the kind of physiology aspects of injuries now and 
how to look after yourself and how to stretch. Just wasn't around then, do you know what I mean? So, I mean, and, and that was probably a, a disappointment because I could have looked after myself better in terms of in yoga, the things that made me so susceptible to hamstring tears. But no, I scored, I scored a lot of goals at, at Chesterfield in that year as well. I don't know. I think that was one. I think it was like a, probably one and three again. I don't even know what I played. Yeah. Well, it was um, one thing that I've, I've seen mentioned a lot as well was the two solo goals, the Boxing Day win against Doncaster, which I've, which I've not seen. So you'll have to em- embellish them. <laughs> I can't remember. And to be fair, the reason why it was so quick on Boxing Day was probably to try to get to the pub. They're probably just in a hurry to get rid of Doncaster. <laughs> um, I think that one of, one of them was a through. I mean, I know that, I mean, I'm, this is a problem, as I see when people ask you, is, and it's very interesting because I do, I do a lot of work with football players. So I do, I still do. And I always say that game management and try to manage the game yourself and think, think the game, don't play it. Because what you find when adrenaline starts kicking in and you actually play 90 minutes, you remember very little about a game. Do you know what I mean? You you remember kind of all the things you did bad. You might remember a goal, but think of that when you play for eighteen years and you score goals all the time, yeah. they actually drift into the patch. Do you know what I mean? Is it, the specific ones I remember? Um, do you know what I mean? But a lot of them fans actually tell me. I mean, I met I met Chesterfield fans with um, the second time around with Tony Bryan. Um, we were in Magaluf, walking along the road, and there was these Chesterfield. There was like a whole family with the strips on, <laughs> and it, it wasn't. It wasn't actually. We walked past them, and um, they must have recognised the recognised us. And then when we, we looked around, we said that was Chesterfield fans. And we looked around, and the next minute they're walking behind us. So we were going to this bar, and we sat down in this bar, but transpires they actually did kind of half recognise us they walked past us they looked round turned round came back and then they told me all about my goals and I was like how do you remember and fans remember everything about games Player, players to be fair I mean I, I know people that tell me about games and what happened and 30 years ago 25 years ago 20 years ago mm. I honestly can't remember so apologies <laughs> Did you have any kind of standout standout games for Chesterfield? Because I mean, I suppose when you came to us, it was you, you came to us because you wanted to kind of be in a bit more successful team, but it didn't really kind of work out, did it? So I think we came no, seventeen. No, it didn't. It actually didn't. Probably the, the Middlesbrough game was probably one. Obviously, playing against Palace and Mowbray, Middlesbrough at that time were. A, a, um, but again, again, the most mostly. The interesting thing about football, you know, is it, it actually becomes a job. And I had this conversation with somebody the other, other week because I actually work with a guy that played for Scarborough, a guy, Jamie Mitchell. So Jamie actually, he's moved out of Scarborough. He played for Norwich and then he came back up to Scotland. And somebody was asking us that question. And I and I said, you know, it does become a job. Mm. Do you know what I mean? So... If, if you ask somebody that does a job for 18 years plumbing or doing something and you say to him, do you remember when you went to Pete's house and you did a sink? Mm-hmm. Very unlikely they're going to remember it. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> or remember it. But, and, and that's the beauty with football as well with the fans. The fans remember absolutely like like Stato. Do you know what I mean? They, they remember every single game you played. Some fans are unbelievably knowledgeable. I mean, so, um, so, so, but I mean, and I, and I, I remember certain games and other games, but most of them were just game. So I, do, I don't. Yeah. Predominantly, I, I didn't play badly. So there was very few games where I played. Some were maybe mediocre. Some were a lot better. But I would tend to probably remember the games that I played badly and the ones that I played probably played well. Yeah. Well, what was it like when you when you go to come in, kind of out of football in retirement again, and then you start watching football? Do, do you actually get the? Do you actually ever get an enjoyment of football like? Oh it, well, do you think, or is it muddled a bit just because of you having had a career in it? No, you 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 actually need to. A lot of players. I was very lucky. Um, I would say compared to some players, because they can go to dark places. One of the one of the problems that you have if you if you, you bear in mind you you 
you play with a chemical balance of being very fit, um, a lot of euphoria, endorphins, adrenaline, do you know what I mean? Over, and then all of a sudden that stops. So you're not training every day. So that chemical is an imbalance a little bit because you're not getting that hit. I mean, so it's like an addiction. Yeah. Um, the football, because you would, so your run up would be to the Saturday. The Saturday would be the, I mean, the nerves, everything like that. Then afterwards, you would go a few beers and kind of calm down, and you would start again on the Monday. So when you do that for so long, and then it stops, and you're maybe playing, you're training twice a week, you really miss it, and you also miss the probably adulation because the the, the thing is that you don't have to queue in nightclubs, you don't have to do a lot of things. You're very well recognised, and all of a sudden you're not. Mm. So, and bear in mind, a lot of players drank heavily over their football career. So when they finished, they would they would carry on, etc. I was very lucky that though I had a kind of period where I drank probably too much and still Jack the lad, um, trying to live the dream. That obviously, been 34, 35. I was very lucky that um, I bumped into somebody and they got me a. a yeah, um, I ended up working for like Xerox and Mueller Packard. Hmm. I was just very lucky that, this, and that that was the thing with me. I was earning a significant amount of money at that time, comparable to football money. Yeah. So I didn't really have that. I need football. Hmm. I need to have a living in football. I've still got the bug. Um, but that did come later on. Um, I mean, I actually was. I think it was. I was offered twice my wage um, by a company to move to Edinburgh when I was manager of Lossy Mouth and basically I had to pack football in. It was an offer. And yeah. I packed football in and moved down to Edinburgh and then started a career in kind of print management. So, yeah. so difficult times for some, but my transition was kind of really good and I took the probably passion, hunger and aggressiveness in business. Mm, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Lee Sharp. Caldwell, it's there! Cookie, take the lead. Dave Caldwell the score at. Super corner from Lee Sharp. And that's the goal that Torquay wanted. 27 minutes gone, it's Torquay 1, Scunthorpe now. And and another another club you had a that you kind of well loved from is Torquay, isn't it? So that was when you left Chesterfield, you went to Torquay, but you didn't really play that many games for Torquay. But you really I was, a, I was a cult hero. <laughs> I, th- I think if you go, you can still find it on YouTube. I think if you actually see what I did at Torquay in a short period of time, and no disrespect to anybody that played else that played there, but Torquay also never a team that was at the top of the league. If you probably look at it like that, so. Mostly when I played for Mansfield, Chester, when we played Torquay, Torquay were fighting relegation every year. So you used to go down there and it was a good night out, you know what I mean? But it was never a, a team that you could go to, you know what I mean? And I, and I think what happened was my sending offs, obviously, my, my physicality got the better of me, I think, at Chesterfield and John Duncan said, look, I think the chairman at the time was complaining about me. Um, there's many reasons for that, some I can't tell. <laughs> <laughs> so the um, and so Dunk says, look, um, Cyril Knowles is coming for you. I, I remember last last time he sadly deceased as well. Um, last time I remember Cyril Knowles, he was at Darlington. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I'll go to Darlington. No way, I'm going to Darlington. He said, No, he's at Torquay. And um, some of the fans will remember um, I had a yellow jag. I had a, I had a, a, a yellow convertible XJS. Uh, when I was laterally in Chesterfield, and I drove down the M5 to Torquay and parked in the car park and um, went up the stairs. And basically, they negotiated a transfer fee. Um, I'm happy for me to go, and it was just for me to agree terms. So they offered, they offered me more money. He took me down and showed me the palm trees. Um, the story was quite funny because he says to me, Are you single? Look at that car. Have you been in Torquay? I mean, Torquay is like. I mean, it's like the nightclubs, it's holiday resort. He says, single lad, you know, you're going to love it down here and everything like that. And um, and they were they were top of the league at the time. And that's what I'm saying. He, he'd amassed a team there that was 
they were an interesting team because they, they weren't full of superstars, but they were very fit. And this is what I'm alluding to. They were very, very fit, very physical, and knew how to uh, organise. So when I signed the contract, he said, um, that's great because I don't think you're fit. I think you've underachieved your whole career. And training starts tomorrow. And basically, he gave me to a guy, a, a, the physio guy, Norman Meadows. They absolutely had me running upstairs, hills with weight jackets on. And they actually battered me for two weeks. So he, he sold me a great story and then just pulled the rug from underneath me. But I scored an overhead kick in my debut. I scored the winner diving header, which to this day they still go on about at Bristol City, which put us through the fifth round of the FA Cup. And I got man of the match at Coventry, um, who were the holders of the FA Cup at the time. Um, I had an overhead kick at Coventry, and it's still on YouTube. Um, I had a chip at Brzezovic. Um, I did a couple of things. I mean, how I did score that game, I got man of the match, etc. But And I think that period I was there, I probably did quite a lot in a short period of time. Hmm. I used to have the long blonde hair and the, the mullet and um, still man, Jack, Jack the Lad and man about town and all, etc. So I think that was the kind of, and I was, I think I was voted cult hero in that BBC series or something, <laughs> Dorky. I'd only, played, I'd only played there about six months. <laughs> I was going to ask you actually where your, where your nickname Shaggy came from. Was that the hair or was it? Thank God. <laughs> I think we'll pass on that. <laughs> That's another one of when I asked Lee Rogers why he was called Nobby. <laughs> <laughs> I was just because he was a... <laughs> no, we'll just, we'll give that one a miss. <laughs> and um, it was interesting when I was looking, you also spent some time in both Belgium and South Africa, didn't you? Yeah, I went to... So again, the sending off. So I got an eight-match ban um, because of the sending offs. I had five cent. I mean, at one time I was the, I think I was the most, I think I am still, somebody still thinks, but I was the most sent off player in British history in one season. So I got sent off five times in one season. So somebody's equaled it. Hmm. But what somebody said was, I was sent off five times before Christmas. Yesterday's ban for eight matches on striker Dave Caldwell was a shattering blow. It's sad, really. It's sad it, how it's all happened and that. I mean, I think he's done marvellous, really, the kid for Torquay, since he's come. Um, and I'm sitting down this afternoon with my chairman and we're going to go through it and just see what we can come up with David as well. It is a pretty uh, incredible record, yeah. five sendings off. Is. And yet, if you take, for instance, the Wolves game, he takes a fair amount of provocation, the lad. He does. You know, I feel the one he got sent off was down at all the shot, his last one. Um, I think possibly the managers are winding some of the defenders up. And I know David nearly got took off by the hips after two minutes down at Alder shot. And uh, he got booked for an handball and a skirmish with the centre half ten minutes later and was sent off. He's got to be a bit shattered. He was even talking uh, about giving the game up, wasn't he? Well, that's right. I mean, what will happen in the future? I mean, if he gets booked, do I pull him off straight away? If I leave him on and he gets another book and he gets sent off, what could it be the sentence? I mean, he's had eight games now. It could be 12, 15 games. You know, I mean, uh, it's worrying. So, and, and, and to be fair, I played a long time for Torquay without really getting sent off or, or I got sent off a couple of times. But we played through the playoffs and everything against Liverpool. Um, so we played up in the playoffs and then played Swansea who got promoted and then Swansea went through all the leagues after that so there were some quite brutal games but Cyril said to me at the end of the season look you're going to an eight match ban I mean actually I think it was myself Vinnie Jones and a couple other people up at the Lancaster Gate up in um, London and I think he got quite a and I got one um, and then there was another players and I got offered to go to Belgium and take the money. Bad decision. Um, took the money. Very good pay. Um, but the league was terrible. The league was terrible. And then I had a chance to go and play at a higher league there because it was a foreign player role. And what they tried to do at the time was actually try to put me with another team, but put me into another team later on. And then I broke my ankle. 
um, coming back for a corner. I always hated going back for corners and never never really did it. And this time I went back and I broke my ankle. And I was left I was left at the end of the season in Belgium in the bossman ruling, but they stopped paying me. They withheld my registration. They were looking for 83000 for me. They were looking for all the money back from the club that was going to sign me. So the only options that was given by the PFA was go to South Africa. I think it was China or somewhere else as well. I could have gone to. Um, and I got a phone call for the guy in South Africa and he basically said, look, lifestyle's great. He says, we're just coming out of apartheid. So it was during apartheid at the time. Um, but you will be playing in, obviously, kind of in the, the league, etc. cetera. And, um, and I says, all right, well, I said, absolutely. Um, I, signed, I signed a two-year agreement there and went there. And um, it was absolutely 70,000 crowds, 30,000 at the worst games, and then no crowds. And then... You just didn't know what you were getting. Games abandoned, games off. I mean, um, all sorts, <laughs> which I won't even tell you. Um, but it was some lifestyle. I mean, it was five-star luxury lifestyle, um, which you look back at that country. And then, obviously, after part, I ended. And then Mandela got a prison, and then we were still playing football. Um, it was crazy. But um, I, I met some wonderful... I managed to meet Pele through being in South Africa because I met Joe Mosono, who played with Pele at New York Cosmos. Jono was a um, absolutely fantastic player. met him, and I actually... In his house was a, an actual news that said that Pele said he was one of the best players he played with. And at the Football Players Awards, I bumped into Pele and I said, you know, you know Joe Mosono? And he goes, yeah, yeah, I know, I know Jono. How do you know him? And I said, I, I played, I played well, I, I trained with him in South Africa. I never actually played with him. I went to his team at one point. Um, and he said, um, he said, oh, he's a great player. I spoke to him about 10 minutes. I was always going to do after dinner speaking because I've got some great stories. <laughs> I've done it a couple of times for charity. Um, and, the, and, he, he, and then I went and went back up and I actually was with uh, Ian Bishop and a couple of West Ham guys. And he said, he speak to Pele about us. I've known him for years. Do you know what I mean? And then <laughs> on the way out, he actually says, David, nice to meet you. <laughs> and um, I, the thing I was always going to do in after dinner speaking was like, Pele, I'm with the boys. I'll catch up with you later. <laughs> but um, to meet Pele, I think, in my career was so That was lucky. African adventure allowed me to have a, a commonality with Pele. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So how did you end up finding your way back to, back to the UK then? Well, I got um, simply the situation in South Africa was getting hairy. <laughs> I mean, some of the games, there was riots at some of the games and some of the happening was because obviously there was a lot of guns. We had guns at the time ourselves. Um, not everybody, but I, I, I went and got one simply. Being in the wrong place at the wrong time in South Africa was always going to be dangerous. And I think it still is. Um, it's a beautiful country, lovely country. So, I decided to come back simply because of that. Um, and then Torquay said, do you want to go back and loan? Do you want to come back and loan? Went back and loan there. Dave Smith was a manager. Second time round is never always the same. Do you know what I mean? I was getting slightly older as well. And, and I wasn't fit because I spent kind of like a year and a bit there. Kind of like, um, kind of like just enjoying myself more or less. When I came, when I came back... Um, they negotiated, they're still on that boss, where well, the bossman ruling finished. Chesterfield negotiated a, a fee with the Belgian club because they still on my registration. So Paul Hart signed me. Paul Hart signed me because Nigel, his brother, said he was one of the best players he ever played against, which was a, a great compliment from Nigel. Um, and then also broke his nose one game. So. <laughs> Hereford second was even better. Chesterfield only half cleared, and Paul Tester launched a rocket of a shot. Worth watching again, and it still looks fast in slow motion. Sadly, that was Hereford's high, all downhill from there. Chesterfield equalised a minute later through Lee Turnbull. And got the winner three minutes after that. The Hereford defence was all over the place and gave Dave Caldwell the softest of winning goals. Yes, yeah, so obviously you came back, so I think it was about 14, 
2000, something like that. It's like 1990, aren't we now? So it's yeah. the Hart McMenemy. I was of. consistent in my transfers fees. I never, I never ever went up. <laughs> hey, but they, they didn't go down too much. So. <laughs> um, yeah, so was the club a lot different when you came back or was it all pretty much? Just no, it was different. And it was, it was different. I mean, RT, a big football likely, because there was, a, there was Chris McMenemy, obviously, as well, was the, was the, the, the manager. But RT liked a night out. So we used to have the, and we used to have days off. And he used to tell us, I mean, they, they told us stories about Cluffy. The stories about Cluffy and Forrest and some of the things that we used to do at Forrest was just unbelievable. Do you know what I mean? Um, just, just mad in what he did. But, um, and they had that element of, so we used to go and have a night out. And we had, at the end of the season, trip. so I'm still actually bound by by the code of silence with this, but we had, we had the, the end of season Magaluf, which was arranged um, by the club, but me and Tony Bryan stayed for another nine weeks. So after that, um, and I arranged it through a friend of mine, that actually was a fullback for Mansfield the one time in a holiday wreck. We arranged the bus to Manchester Airport when we landed. He arranged the hotel, well, the, the, you know, the kind of apartments. He arranged everything. Um, and we lost we lost Spring Gun and Paul McGugan for about two days. So we arrived at four o'clock in the morning. They went straight into a pub and came out two days later. Um, it was a mad week. Um, do you know what I mean? But it was just absolutely mental but um loved it <laughs> don't miss it yeah and and was it nice was it nice coming back to chesterfield come coming back to something a bit more familiar? yeah it, it wasn't it wasn't because it, you know at that point i was getting my my fitness had gone um and i was carrying more weight so my pace had gone so i i ended up being more of a target player um could still score goals, but I mean, probably let myself down. And I, and I think going to Belgium, the the Belgium and the the South African adventure, um, we look at it, really diminished my fitness. It wasn't that full time kind of focus like it like it is in the UK mm. and in the top leagues. So, although we trained full time in South Africa, um, we didn't train full time in Belgium. So. It was um, it was three nights a week, yeah. so um, my fitness had gone, and I, and I kind of got a lot of level of frustration. Um, it was probably my fitness then, my fitness as the bench of my career. I played a did a reserve match at Sheffield United and did my cartilage, and that was basically. And it was the it was actually the, the yeah it was the Queen's Medical Centre in Nottingham. It was a bucket handle tear, and the consultant. Who operated on it did Prince Charles's elbow from the, the polo pony fall the day before. He was obviously better at elbows than he was at knees. <laughs> he was absolutely, he was right. So he said, Your knee will be perfect. He just didn't don't tell me how long. So it, it was a year really till it was okay. Mm-hmm. And I had to retire during that time and then go play part time back at. It was Inverness Cali and then Cali Thistle when they were merging. So, um, and it was it was probably a level of fitness that that contributed to my cartilage tear because I just wasn't fit. Did that is that is that cartilage injury something that still sticks around with you a bit, or is it? Uh, I I played no that cartilage has been absolutely brilliant apart from a couple of instances over the years. But I played. I mean, I'm showing my age now. I'm 60, 61 now. I played. Five aside two weeks ago for the first time. I actually had a, a lot of people won't know this as well, but two years ago I had a heart attack, um, dropping trees down and got two stents in. So although I was very fit, unfortunately, hereditary side of my father, my father had a bypass, my grandfather had a heart attack, died of a heart attack. So I inherited, um, unfortunately, those dodgy arteries. Um, but I drove myself to AE and bizarrely enough, I know no chest pains, jumped in the car, just didn't feel well. Mm. Drove to A&E and they thought, you look fit, you're fine, everything's great. And then it was a blood result. So I got a couple of stents in two years ago. Um, so kind of over the years and, and obviously the knee, but I've, that was the first time for two years I played five-a-sides. The knee was slightly sore, but 
seems to be getting better again now. So, mm. touch wood. When I look when I look back over my my career, I mean, I've I've been lucky enough to have two two careers. So one in business, um, you know, become a business manager. Um, so it's quite interesting that the that the, that the cloud creation now. I mean, I know technology inside out. So it's, so, and I also know football inside out mostly because yeah. what I did do when I went back into football for a while, I had a three-year research study at Stirling University on player development. And we researched psychology, physiology, and basically the components of ability. So, and I've also worked for clubs over the years in analytics, opposition analytics. So I've got a, a very good broad knowledge of football, how it works, etc., and mm. things so. I've really got no regrets looking looking back. Um, got a lovely family, do you know what I mean? So I, I just think um, I should be grateful for I've still got my health. I know I had a wee scare, but um, I should have realised, you know, at that time that I was, I couldn't, I mean, I couldn't wash the car. I couldn't actually, I thought I was getting old, I'm just getting unfit, but I couldn't actually wash the car without being out of breath. Couldn't grasp it being out of breath. And now after getting a couple of stents in, Walking five miles, ten miles, playing five aside, and back working and I'm fine. Yeah, yeah. So. amazing. Yeah. And, and are there any? Uh, do you think there's any specific skills that you learnt as a footballer that have been quite transferable into business? Yeah, and it's interesting because one of the things we've been involved in, so we've, we've taken on. So I'm working in how to get from football to finance. So um, the guy that, one of the guys, well, he used to work for me years ago, started his own finance company and he had his own health issues with a brain tumour. He asked me to come into the business and help him. Hmm. It was probably just the right time because of, of mine, but I wasn't working. So I agreed to come in. But I, um, so processes, so one of the things I used to do was go into some of the, the larger organisations and look at processes and to make them more efficient. So if you look at football, so one of the things I'm, I think you could do with um, young adults that are maybe struggling to get jobs or don't appreciate business or business life, like sport, like football, is it's very similar. So you still have its preparation, its organisation. I mean, it's, um, it's basically there's components of in business and in football. So one of the courses I was wanting to run at the foundation was to take kids in and show them how to organise a back four, what a partner play looks like, why teams play systems, etc. And same in business, why you need good foundations in business like CRMs, um, SharePoint, you know what I mean, communication systems, marketing and things like that. It's all the components that, that makes you successful. It's the same in football. It's the same for a player individually also units and collectively as a team. So, I mean, it's it's those components that compensate for your weaknesses that allow you to achieve what you want. You don't inherit talent from anywhere. It's basically hard work. Yeah, and I, and I suppose any successful team is like any successful business, isn't it, in that it has those different components and different people have different strengths and, you know, but collectively... Absolutely, no, and absolutely, and it's and it's getting into jail and going the same direction. And one of the things that probably helped me is my man management because I've I've, I've been and I, probably one of, my, one of the regrets. If you're asking about regrets, one of my regrets is not being into football management. But I went into business management, and um, and I and I've mentored a couple of managers over the years. Um, a couple of years ago at Clyde um, Football Club, again I mentored a young young kind of manager and he was just fascinated he was a sponge do you know what I mean just and he said he learned more from having conversations with me than he'd learned from I mean going on courses mm -hmm. I mean but um no, I, I honestly think that you, you can learn life skills from football and also the things that don't go well in football and the reasons they don't go well do you know what I mean yeah you need to be resilient as a football player. So one of the things, and I look back and um, fix myself now, but I couldn't fix myself then. I didn't have enough knowledge or support then. But if I could turn the clock back to being 22, 
I could fix myself now with my mindset um, and my focus um, and being resilient, etc. So um, I didn't. It was fight or flee. So at yeah. that time, a lot of times I would flee to the pub or flee because things weren't working out. Or where now I realise that you need to dig in. You know I mean, definitely the competitiveness has always been in my in, in my, my genes. I've got a daughter as well, um, Marcia. Um, it's, it's with my wife Susan here, and um, she's she's competitive. She's a street dancer. Um, but I can see that um, she's done very well at school recently, got all A's, etc. I can see that competitive edge in her when I, I kind of look at her and I think, like, I don't know if she doesn't go over, she doesn't go over and start hitting people throughout school, which is good, <laughs> unlike me. I was going to uh, say, if if we do get you in a in a charity match uh, again at any point, it'd be very fitting if you could like score four goals and then get sent off or something. <laughs> <laughs> I think no, it was. I th- I look, I look back at some of the time. I was sent off after, I think it was 14 minutes for persistent bowling. I mean, how many times do you get the ball in 14 minutes? <laughs> what, what happened as well, it did snowball. You've got, you've got, and it doesn't happen now in the game because it's, it's, it's more of a, there's more of respect in the game now where there was a, a lesser respect in those days. It was more of a, you get wound up. I mean, things would happen off the ball. And then referees be looking for you. Mm. I mean, so you would react to something and get sent off. And some of my sending offs were ridiculous. Um, my dad came to watch me when I retired. Actually, I got sent off one game after about a minute. Believe it or not, the ball went back to goalkeeper. He kicked it. I jumped with a guy. He went down holding his face. To this day, never hit him. Never touched him. And I got sent off because of my reputation. Mm. My dad was five minutes late for the game. My dad w- went in and sat down and said, is he not playing? And the guy says, no, he's been on. <laughs> he's my dad looked at his watch and went, you're joking. <laughs> he said, did he get injured? He went, oh, no, he never got sent off, did he? <laughs> so um, It's interesting, though, because players do get the cards marked, don't they, either as being divers or as being, you know, aggressive or, you know, they yeah. do, don't they? Yeah, you, you do, and, and I think it's it's a and it's a fine line. That, and, and I used to run a fine line, um, so I was at my best when I was on that pacey aggressive streak. Do you know what I mean? So I, I was very aggressive with my runs and my my tackling and everything like that. And I was at my best at that point. And that was a problem. I would flip over the line. Do you know what I mean? So it was a, a very fine line to tread. Um, but that's, that's one of the things where I said to you, I was the competitiveness. I, I used to get myself into a competitive mindset to be the best I could be. Well, well then you've obviously, like you said, there may be things that you did in your career. You think, oh, I could have done that a bit differently or something like that. But you look at your career on, on paper and you think, wow, it looks, it looks pretty enjoyable. You, you, obviously, you obviously had a lot of fun during your career. Yeah, it was, it was very enjoyable. And that's what a lot of people say. I mean, you play, I played 18 years I mean, as a professional football player. Um, I never reached the heights I probably should have. Um, but that in itself, 0.2% make it, something like that. So, so and I think a lot, a lot of the guys on the, the WhatsApp group obviously still kind of remind us. I mean, Kevin Hitchcock at the moment, at, um, he's across at Boston Revolution, goalkeeping coach. And um, Kevin and me were great mates at Mansfield. We spent a lot of time abroad as well in Ibiza over the years. And um, we still say, I mean, he, he said one of the things in the chat, he said, listen, we've all done, we've all, all done massively to actually play football. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? So, and I don't think at the time a lot of us actually appreciated it as much because it was a job. We kind of just believe that the way it was, and I'd probably a lot of us were ar- arrogant as well, and um, it which comes with the territory a lot of times when you've got to go on a pitch. You know what I mean, you need a level of arrogance, yeah, but that could spill over into your personal life when you become a bit of a pain in the bum. Do you know what I mean? But um, just like you get that in general in people anyway. So, yeah. But um, no, I'll look back and um, if I could turn the listen, we all say the same thing. If we could turn the clock back, if we could if we could go and have another charity match 
all get back together. Um, Phil Walker was organising and things like that. It would be great. You know what I mean? Yeah. Get on that pitch again, pull the boots on, get in the dressing room, and the, the memories come running back. 